Welcome to the talk, an overview of software development at the Square Kilometer Array Observatory. My name is Johan. I work for the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, and the SK, and we're part of the SKA project. Um, South Africa's involvement is driven through Sereo, and we're part of the National Research Foundation. On the screen is my email address. Feel free to email me with uh, questions or corrections, that's also fine. And quick disclaimer, uh, the views and opinions expressed in this talk are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of any entities I represent. And then the image credit is either SKO or SRAO unless otherwise indicated. So that's all the legalese. <coughs> so in this talk, we'll, I'll just quickly mention who the SKO is, a very short primer on radio astronomy. We'll look at the processes and tools that we use in our day-to-day -day development. And then we'll get a little bit more practical. We'll look at how we're working towards driving a telescope. And then the last half hour is what we can do better. No, just kidding. <laughs> so the kind of tagline of the SKO is that it's one observatory, two telescopes, and three continents. The three continents being Australia, where they're building the SKA mid, uh, low antenna array, um, Africa, where we're building the dishes up in the Northern Cape, and Europe, where the head office is. Uh, the head office is located just outside Manchester at Jodrell Bank. And the goal of the SKO is to design, build, and operate the observatory. And it's a combination of lots of different countries that got together, and they're governed by treaties. Uh, last time I checked, there's about, about 16 countries. There might be a couple more. Every now and again, we'll see a news release with another country that's signed on. And they provide uh, together just shy of 2 billion euros. And that pays for the construction of the telescopes as well as the first 10 years of operation. Quick look at the dishes we're building now. So these are the um, kind of dishes we're building. The new ones have a 15 meter um, uh, wide dish. We're building 133 of those, and they will be added to the 64 existing meerkat dishes, and in the end they will all work together. And the max baseline is 150 kilometers, so that's the maximum distance between the two furthest dishes. And then in Australia, they're building the antenna array. Yeah, building a lot of those. <laughs> they're building 256 of those antennas put together forms a station, and there's going to be 512 of those stations in the Australian outback. So a very large uh, antenna array. And just a quick primer on radio astronomy. What's the deal with radio astronomy? So on the graph on the screen, you can see from your left to right is the frequency ranges um, of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves. That's the, the Earth um, gets subjected to. And that dark band over there is the opacity of the atmosphere. So you can see the higher frequencies get completely blocked by the atmosphere. Uh, fortunately for us, otherwise we would just get <laughs> quick cancers. <laughs> and we've got a little gap there by the visible light. So that's what you can see by the rainbow there. And then towards the lower frequencies, you'll see there's a big gap where the atmosphere doesn't block the frequencies at all. And that's the kind of frequencies that we're interested in. So what can we actually see with radio telescopes? So as per uh, illustration, on the left there, there's a picture of just a normal optical telescope. And on the right, there's a representation of um, the, the same bodies in the heaven. And what's really noticeable is that we can actually see that these things are interacting with each other. And that's the, the real power of radio astronomy. So let's look at the processes. I'll just quickly run through these. Um, so on the hardware side, it's just third party providers, um, standard project management. Um, they work on fixed timelines to provide the hardware. And then more interesting on the software side, um, the SKO makes use of SAFE, Scaled Agile Framework. It's essentially agile for very large organizations. And we work in three-month increments. So we plan three months ahead. And that constitutes about five two-week development sprints and then a three-week or so uh, innovation and planning sprint. 
And what's really nice in the innovation and planning sprint is that we get the opportunity to kind of work on things that might not be directly related to your day-to-day -day job. So you have, um, yeah, so you can explore new technologies or learn something new. And another cool thing of that is that at the end of that sprint, um, we actually have um, lightning talks and all the teams can present what they've learned or some new technology. And interestingly enough, a lot of the things that's shared in those um, or, or uh, discovered in those innovation and planning sprints actually makes its way back into the product. So that's really time well spent in my belief. Um, Safe at SKA works quite well in my view, but it did not work well at other companies I worked at. So it's definitely not a, not a panacea. And yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts around that, but <laughs> let's just keep it there. Um, our development effort is broken up into three teams. So we've got observation, monitoring, control, around 10 teams, science data processing, around seven, and the services team, which includes like our system team that takes care of the infrastructure, DevOps, integration and verification. They're part of the system team and there's around seven of those and they are distrib distributed throughout the globe. And then very importantly, we have a program team and the program teams are the ones that keeps an eye on the backlog and decides what direction we need to take. Um, they set the goals for these three month increments and they also flesh out the requirements and they essentially sign off the software that we deliver to them. And we actually work very closely with our program team. Um, I'm not sure if that applies to all teams, but you know, we feel that we want to be accountable and we want to make sure that we're always um, working in the same direction that they had in mind. So we're quite uh, open to working with them a lot. And the development team, pretty standard agile team, five or so developers, a scrum master and a product owner. Nothing fancy there. And then pulling in the same direction. Now you can imagine that you've got all these teams across the globe and they're not necessarily all system, uh, software developers. So you've got different strengths for different teams. And, but it's important for us to always keep a high standard of software that we deliver. So we do two, a few things to help in that regard. So the one is that our standards are codified and you can actually go check it out at developer.skao.int and all our coding style and standards are described there and teams are expected to follow that. And then we also leverage tools. So we use GitLab and one of the things that GitLab offers us is a, like a GitLab bot for all the merge requests. So every time you create a merge request, there's a bot that runs and checks your repository and make sure that your license is correct, make sure the structure is right, make sure that you've got documentation and it will keep bugging you until you've resolved those issues. Um, so that's just a few things we try and implement to keep a high standard of code that we deliver. Asynchronous work, so obviously um, we work with a wide range of time zones. Um, so one way we do um, help teams with that is that if there's maybe an architectural decision that needs to be made, there won't just be a meeting where a decision will be made, it will actually be written up um, teams will be given an opportunity to comment on any kind of design decisions and then after a period of time um, that decision gets taken. And also asynchronous meetings, so that's more with uh, like the scrum masters. They're just expected to um, fill in certain forms to track progress at a certain time. So rather than being in a meeting where everybody has to say their piece one after another, they just um, fill out the appropriate forms and then if the program team needs to reach out, they'll just do that directly. And one very nice thing is uh, the community of practices. And that is just a space where it's dedicated to certain topics. So it could be testing or UX UI or a specific technology that we use. And we have Slack channels dedicated to those. So if I'm not so familiar with Python testing and I find that my PyTest is not picking up all my tests. I can just quickly pop into that channel, ask a question, and there's always people willing to answer. So that's just a nice way of upskilling one another. On the technology side, yeah, so GitLab is our backbone, um, source control, CI, CD. We do the whole 
um, uh, building, linting, testing, building documentation, uploading artifacts, the whole spiel. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. We use Kubernetes as well. Um, yeah, all of our software that we deliver are containerized. We package those containers together, those services together and with Helm charts. And Helm is really a powerful tool for us. It makes it easy for us to kind of fan out our software in the sense that we have multiple um, services per dish. And with just a Helm flag, I can say I want to deploy 10 of those sets of devices and they will all be configured appropriately. So yeah, Helm's quite a, quite a valuable tool for us. And in our integration environment currently, we have around 20 charts, and each of those have several pods and services and ingresses and what have you. <coughs> um, yeah, GitLab and Kubernetes is quite tightly integrated. So from a pipeline, one of our testing steps is that we actually create a namespace deploy our solution in there, run our tests, um, capture the test output, and then destroy that namespace. So that's really useful for us. Um, and then we have clusters around the globe. So if I want to deploy something in Canada, for example, because a piece of hardware is available to, for, for us over there, then I can just tag the correct GitLab runner, and it will actually deploy it in that cluster over there. So that's quite nice for us. Nexus artifact repository, so all of our packages that gets built, um, Docker containers, Helm charts, everything gets uploaded into the Nexus, and that's made available then across all the teams. Uh, quick run through these. So Confluence for document management. Um, on the Confluence side, is a very good practice that we do is um, the majority of the meetings will have a dedicated Confluence page, and in that Confluence page we'll have the agenda who should attend, who ended up attending. We'll have notes in there, and we will also upload the recording of a meeting on that uh, meeting page. So if anybody missed a meeting for some reason, they can go and see what was discussed, or actually watch the full video just to uh, catch up. Yeah, everybody knows Jira. We use uh, Jira with a plugin called X-Ray for test result tracking. Not a big fan, personally. And then Slack for instant messaging. <clears throat> All right, so now we get to something that might be newer for some of you. So Tango Controls. Tango Controls really are our backbone uh, software. It's really a toolkit that can be used to drive um, hardware or software components. And we use it for SCADA, so supervisory control and data, um, data acquisition. And another type of those protocols is OPC UA. So you might be familiar with that, similar to OPC UA. Uh, supports a few languages. Um, it's about 20 years old, open source. Um, it still uses Corba for synchronous communication and Zero MQ for the eventing subsystem or asynchronous communication. Yes, there are still people using Corba. <laughs> and just as illustration, so in the top one, you can see we've got some kind of hardware device. The hardware device is driven by a driver. The driver has a Tango interface in front of that, and the client can communicate to that interface. And the same with a software device. So some application logic is driven through the Tango interface, and the client can connect uh, in a standard way and uh, yeah, do what it needs to do. So just some code. So here's an example of a Tango device server. So this is just a fictional device, a power supply. And there's two main things about Tango controls. The one is attributes. And as you can see, our power supply has a voltage attribute. And that means that piece of hardware will output what the current voltage is, and it will be exposed to clients through that attribute. And we can give it some information, like the data type of the little description. We can say the access level, so read, write, or just read in this case. And then the second thing that Tango Controls gives us is commands. And yeah, commands is just functions you can execute on a device server. And in this case, we're telling it to turn on. So that device will do whatever it needs to do to turn on and then set its state to on. And then any client can see, hey, this device is now on. And then the same on the client side. So just in an example. Um, first thing you want to do is create a device proxy to a Tango device server. 
all Tango devices follow the same naming scheme, so it's the domain, the family, and the member, and it's just a way to group different device servers together, so if you can maybe use the same domain across a set of devices. Once I have my device proxy, I can ping it to see if this thing is actually alive. We can introspect it. Um, we can ask for the attribute list, so that gives us all the attributes. We can then read the attribute, and we can see that we're reading operating mode in this case, and the operating mode is standby. Um, it's an int enum, so that's why the two is there. <laughs> And then we get to the really powerful bit. So I can actually subscribe to certain attributes I'm interested in, and I can choose what kind of events I wanted to subscribe to. So in this case, I'm subscribing to a change event. So whenever that value changes, some callback gets fired, uh, the callback I provide. <coughs> and in that example, we're just printing out that the operating mode is number two. And we can also get the command list, so that will give us all the commands that are available on the Tango device. And in this case, I call startup mode, and that mode is one, so it triggered that callback again and printed out the new value. Right, so that's all the background, so let's get a little bit more practical now. <clears throat> so how is our team working towards driving a telescope? So just some context, so we have different layers of control. At the very top, we have our GUIs. We use a web-based uh, GUI for Tango controls called Taranta. And we have our scripting interface. Um, we use Jupytango, which is a kind of flavor of Jupyter. And then at the very top is our central node. And all of those are Tango devices. So our central node is responsible for the entire telescope. Below that, we have our subarray nodes. And what's important with subarray nodes is that a observation um, a scientist might not need to use all the dishes in the array for a specific observation. So if they want to listen to a very faint signal, they would ask for a bunch of um, dishes that's close together so that you could get very high sensitivity. Or if they want to look at a larger area um, with higher resolution, they would ask for dishes that's very far apart. So uh, scientific observation only uses a subset of the actual dis dishes, and that grouping of that subset goes into a subarray a sub node. <coughs> so an operator, when he's scheduling an uh, observation, he would move dishes in and out of a subarray, and then he would command them to go from standby low power to standby full power and, and execute an observation. Then for every dish, there's a dish leaf node, and our dish leaf node really is where the kind of application logic lives or the business logic. So it knows what to do depending on the state of the dish. So for example, if we had five in a subarray that's on low power and five that's on full power, we would tell the entire subarray to go to full power, and then the dish leaf nodes would know that, hey, my dish is in low power, I need to tell it to go to full power or it would say, hey, my dish is already in full power, I don't have to do anything. And then lastly, at the, at the very bottom, we have our dish manager, and our dish manager is responsible for directly interacting with the components on a dish. Now, a dish itself uh, consists of many different components, and not all of those components, all of those attributes, uh, all that information about the device is necessarily relevant to our upstream devices. So the dish manager just exposes what is really required for the upstream devices. And <clears throat> another important thing that it does is it aggregates the state of the uh, components on the dish. So say, for example, one of the components is in a faulty state, then the dish manager would mark that entire dish as faulty because we don't want to run an observation, produce all the science data just for that science data to be thrown out because one of the dishes was faulty and they're seeing weird anomalies. All right, so, so what is our goal? Our goal as a team at the moment is to create a Tango device that drives and reports on a dish, and it needs to connect to all the different components in the dish and needs to report um, what their values are. There's only one problem. None of those hardware either exists, or if it exists, we might not have access to it, 
Um, it might be an active development. It might be a way for RFI testing, whatever the case may be. But we don't have anything to connect to yet. And we don't want to wait until all of the components have been installed and the dishes have been built before building our software. Well, that's a complete waste of time. <clears throat> So our systems engineers come to the rescue. Now, system engineering is a whole talk on itself, but essentially what they do is they take very complex systems and break it down into smaller pieces and define the interfaces between those, pe between those pieces. And this is really an ongoing process. This is something that started long before construction began. They actually produced a whole set of documentation for the entire dish. And that was audited and signed off prior to construction. So the good thing is that we have those um, interface control documents, or ICDs. And another thing that the ICDs describe is uh, the behavior of each of the components. So we know how to talk to a component, and we have an approximation of how it should act. Um, the different interfaces, we have a wide variety, so it either could be other Tango devices. Sometimes the procurement contract states that the supplier has to provide a component with a Tango interface, or it could be OPC UA, or it could be some custom binary protocol. Um, any of those could be what we need to connect to. <clears throat> but since we know what that interface should look like, and we know sort of how it should behave, we then went as a team and built our software simulators. And that gives us the ability for our dish manager actually to connect to something. And because they're software simulators and because we have full control over it, we can kind of poke it when we're doing our testing to invoke certain conditions, you know, which might not be available um, to us on a physical device. So we can spin up those and use that for our testing. Just a quick note on the unit tests. Um, yeah, pretty standard. We use the humble object pattern. So all of our device servers, are the logic is really divorced from the Tango interface. And that makes it possible for us to just run through all our scenarios and just test our business logic and make sure that they act in the correct way. Uh, we use uh, PyTest parameterize. We have a whole bunch of conditions and expected outcomes, and we can very quickly test all our functionality. But we also need to test the interfaces, and Tango Controls actually has some really nice tools to help in that regard. We could spin up these device servers um, and test the interfaces, and also the communication between our dish manager and our other devices by just driving our dish manager. And uh, yeah, so that gives us confidence that we've implemented those interfaces correctly and that we behave as we should. And it still looks like a unit test. It's actually pretty nice. Then I mentioned this earlier, but just to expand on it a bit. So for every pipeline that runs, we actually build a complete deployment. So we create a namespace in the cluster. We do our Helm install. Um, what's really nice with the Helm is that we can tell Helm to use the image we actually just built in the previous step. So we always have the freshest code that gets deployed to a namespace. And then we have a set of tests that run on that complete solution. So we not only test um, the functionality itself, we also test the deployment. Because one day that, that is how it will be deployed in the field. And yeah, so that gives us really confidence that our devices works as it should. And then our very highest level of testing is our BDD test or our behavior-driven tests. That's really our end-to-end -end testing. It's defined in a Cucumber format. I've got an example on the next page. <clears throat> so our Cucumber format is really good for us um, because these tests are actually tied to dish requirements. So when they develop the dish, there's a whole set of requirements that they identified. And these tests are tagged to those requirements. And the format works well in the sense that someone that's not a developer can go and read that um, test and figure out whether it actually covers the requirement or not, without needing to know any programming. 
So that's actually a, an example of one of our, um, except we call it acceptance tests, one of our acceptance tests. And in this test, we're going from standby low power to standby full power. And we describe the whole, whole um, test cycle. So we say our dish manager starts in low power. Um, it accepts the set standby full power mode command. Then uh, dish manager's dish mode should report that it's now in full power mode. And then we also have additional checks on the other components that we connect to that they also then um, um, report the appropriate dish mode. Yeah, so that's really important for us. <coughs> so one fine day, we finally get some access to a hardware component, and we're all very excited. And now what we can do is we can actually just switch off our software simulator and connect to the real physical component. And we can then go and execute our full test suite. And because everybody implemented the ICD strictly and no one um, had different opinions on the behavior and no one made spelling mistakes or anything, all of those tests passed the first time. <laughs> no, that's not what happens at all. <laughs> But that's okay, because now we have a baseline, right? So we can go back to our product team and say, well, these are the 50 tests that's failed, and we can schedule time and start debugging those. And very often, they come from ambiguity in these ICD documents, in the interface control documents. So we would then reach out to the whoever's running that component and say, this is how we understood it. This is what it's described in the document. And then there's actually a formal process to raise a change. So you have to, <laughs> you have to raise an ECP or an engineering change um, proposal. And in that, you describe what's happening, what should happen. And that gets distributed to all the relevant parties. And that gets officially signed off. And that copy signed document gets filed away. So it's kind of an onerous process. Yes, it takes a long time. But it's really important um, for the auditors to, that can come back and actually follow all the changes for between the different uh, components. So what can we do better? <laughs> so these are being worked on, um, and it's still fairly early days. One real pain point is debugging. Now, you can imagine that. If a command on the top level gets issued and that gets distributed throughout the chain of devices and all of those devices are spewing logs and their states are changing, it's really difficult to go and troll through all of those and to figure out what went wrong somewhere in that process. So one thing we're doing to help with that is to actually have a kind of tracing solution where we can at least tag all the um, uh, all the logs with a specific tracing ID, and that ID is generated and shared across that chain of commands. So, yeah, that should go a long way to making it easier, but there's definitely need for better tools. I think as we're going forward, it's going to get more and more important because we're going to start hitting all those weird edge cases. Um, so we definitely need better tooling there. And then just running the full solution. So. Yeah, we've recently crossed the 32 gigs of RAM um, resource reservation for Kubernetes for a solution. So as you can imagine, you, you can't really run that locally. So it's really tough for the integration teams that needs to deploy the whole thing. And what the other teams, what we do is we just run a subset of the devices. And even then, it's quite resource intensive. And you could very well argue that we're quite wasteful with our resource uh, reservations, and you would be correct. <laughs> <coughs> so the, uh, the folks that run our full integration environment, uh, they actually have to deploy it in the cluster itself where there's sufficient resources. The only negative there is that it's really difficult to kind of just quickly hack something to test the change and to see if it will fix a problem. There's a whole turnaround time to get that um, changes into that integration environment. And then giving back, um, both Sereo and the SKO are part of the Tango Controls Foundation. 
and we pay a fee for that, but that gives us a seat on the steering committee, so we do have some say in um, the direction of development of Tango Controls, and that money is also used to pay for website hosting and maybe some contract work to fix an issue or develop a new feature. Obviously, we do a lot of work with Tango Controls, so we're building our own tools, we're improving existing tools, and all of that gets fed back into the system for everyone to use. And yeah, the vast majority of our work is open source, so you can actually go to gitlab.com uh, sk-telescope, go read through some of the repos there. Everything is, is open for you to look at. Um, yeah, it uses BSD3 new license, so you, you, if you have a project that wants to use Tango Controls, you can actually go and use that software as well. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Just a quick plug. So, Sereo is hosting a big conference in October for all this kind of con uh, control system related work. Lots of the large um, accelerators in Europe and some of the American institutions, they all come down and they're coming down to Cape Town this year. So if, if these control systems are at any way interesting to you, yeah, Google Control Systems Conference October Cape Town, <laughs> and then you'll find it. Right, and then a big thank you. Big thanks to um, yeah, Soraya and SKO, especially our management, um, for the opportunity and for the organizers. And the usual, we're highly hiring spiel. Um, Soraya is really a great place to work for. We have a very big emphasis on skills uh, development and, and upskilling our team members. So we have all different levels. We do internships. We've got a graduate in training program. And then, obviously, we're always looking for developers themselves. Yeah. <clears throat>